Welcome to our talk, Race Against the Machine Clear. It will be about the machine clear transient execution uh, vulnerabilities that we, we have found. Here we will see some strange corner case of modern processors and how we managed to, to exploit them. We also present a full end-to-end -end exploit later in the presentation running on Firefox. But before that, uh, just a presentation. So I am Enrico, uh, I made this work with the, uh, my colleague Hani Ragab that will speak later, and also with the help of Herbert and Cristiano. And all of us are coming from the WUSEC uh, system security group in uh, Amsterdam. And uh, the talk today will be split as follows mainly. We start with a small background section, and then we we have the core of the presentation that is about machine clears. Uh, also later, we're going to present the full end-to-end -end exploit uh, uh, on Firefox. And finally, some conclusion and uh, results. Okay, let's start uh, with something funny. Uh, just by looking at this image, you can see something is odd. You can see a roof with melted, with, with mel mel ah, melted snow. And, you know, just by walking on the street and seeing this, is suspicious, right? And we think that this is a perfect example of uh, side channel, because here uh, the uh, Dutch police managed to find guys growing legally weed uh, in their apartment just by looking at the roof, because as you can guess, the high temperature was melting the snow. And uh, yeah, they just caught these, uh, these guys with a side channel, okay? So they don't see people grow weed, but just by the uh, metal snow, they, they managed to uh, guess that. Uh, however, today we're not talking about weed side channel, but CPU side channel. So the most famous one, and also easy to, to use, is to use a timing side channel, and not the, uh, for example, the for a thermal side channel. And it's kind of simple in the end. So. Here we have an example where we have an attacker and a victim, and they share a common resource, for example, the array that you can see on the bottom. The first step is to bring the, this shared resource, also in the data cache, in a known state, for example, by flashing the entire cache. So we know that every entry of the array is not present in the cache. Later, the victim, for example, uh, will access uh, uh, some array entries depending on a secret bit. And let's say that, for example, uh, the secret key bit is, uh, um, is one. So we're accessing entry one, okay? Later, the attacker just need to perform the reload step that is simply measuring the log time of every array entry. And as you can expect, the first load will be quite slow because array zero is not in the cache. The second one will be much faster because the victim already brought into the cache the first entry of the array, and the others will be also slow. So by observing the, this timing side channel, so this timing difference of load operation, we can interfere that, uh, we can infer that the, the victim actually, um, the, the crypto key bit of position i was equal to, to one. Things get extremely interesting when we combine this timing side channel with transient execution or speculative execution. So modern processors try to predict the, the flow of the program to increase the throughput. And probably you know there are we have the branch predictor. And let's look at this simple example. Let's suppose that we have an if condition where we need to execute the branch only if we are inbound, okay? And let's imagine that the array size is not uh, available because for example, it's coming from a a slow load operation. The processor for sure will not wait to know the array size. It will speculatively execute the, the branch. And uh, if this happens, this load will be speculatively executed, for example. And the, the cache will be populated with array at position x. Let's suppose that in the end, this branch prediction was wrong. Uh, the processor must, uh, you know, destroy all this uh, wrong path in the pipeline and restart the execution from the correct path. However, 
this micro arbitral trace, so this uh, access to array X, was, uh, it happened, okay, it's, it's still there. And an attacker using, again, this timing side channel can observe what the processor did in a wrongly speculated branch. So the rest is basically history, as you can see. This is a timeline of all the attacks that are based on these two simple primitives. We start with early 2018 with the famous Spectre and Meltdown. Then later we had the L1 terminal fault, uh, it was quite powerful. Then in 2019 we had the big class of uh, micro architectural data sampling with many variants as you can see, uh, leaking from different buffers. We also had the first injection attacks, the Robbie Bell injection. And even uh, kind of recent, the crosstalk uh, attack uh, even uh, broke the barrier of the single core, so these attacks was even working among physical different cores. And now in this talk, we're presenting the let's say, newest transient execution attacks that are based on machine clear, that are the topic of today. And we managed to find two uh, vulnerabilities named floating point with injection and speculative code for the cores. Now I'll leave the, the word to Ryan. All right, so before get, getting into the different attacks that we presented today, uh, let's take a step back and look at uh, what is the root cause of all these different types uh, of uh, transit execution uh, vulnerability that have been found so far. And Intel defines bad speculation as the root cause of discarding issues, uh, issued micro operations on x86 processors. And it also defines that there are two main subclasses of this behavior. The first one is called branch misprediction where a branch detector mispredicts either the direction uh, or the target uh, of a branch, as we saw earlier. And uh, the second subclass of batch speculation is called machine clear, where uh, a machine clear condition flushes the entire pipeline and then the, the CPU resumes the execution from the last retired instruction. So it's not just about a mispredicted branch, but it's the entire pipeline once the machine clear condition occurs. So as we said, Branch misprediction have been widely uh, explored in uh, previous attacks like Spectre and along with different ways of creating faults and uh, different ways of aborting an Intel uh, TSX uh, transaction. Many attacks have been focused only on these on variants of these root causes, but the same cannot be said about a class of machine clear where uh, up until to this point it remains widely unexplored. And this is what we are going to uh, explain in this presentation. So in this work, we're going to, uh, we performed the reverse engineering and the security analysis of uh, four main types, four different root causes that can create a transit execution path uh, on uh, modern CPUs. And the first one is called self-amplifying code machine clear. Then we have floating point, memory ordering, and memory zone degradation machine clear. Two of these led us to obtain uh, two new transit execution based attack primitives. The first one is called speculative code store by pass, which is based on a self-amplifying machine clear. And the second one is called floating point value injection, which is based on a floating point machine clear. Furthermore, floating point value injection led us to uh, obtain and mount an end-to-end -end attack on uh, Firefox, leaking arbitrary memory addresses with a leakage rate that can reach 13 kilobytes per second. And this is what we're uh, going to see uh, later in detail. So in order to understand more the different types uh, of machine clear that we're talking about today, we first try to understand what is the architectural invariant at the core of each type of machine clear. Then how this invariant can be violated and therefore triggering the machine clear for the pipeline flush. Then what is the what are the security implications of uh, uh, this invariant violation? And finally, how this violation can be exploited. And these are the four points that we're going to focus on when we are studying the different types of machine clear that we presented. So the first type that we're talking about today is called self-modifying code machine clear, and it's based on a self-modifying code. What is a self-modifying code? It's a program storing instructions as data, uh, modifying its own code as it's being executed. It has been widely used in the malware, it's trying to unpack themselves when it's the uh, right moment. That's just one example, but here we are going to see a self-modifying code in a completely different uh, way. So let's take a look at this uh, snippet of code. We have two instructions. The first one is modifying the following one, changing it from uh, a load secret to a no operation. Modern front ends in modern x86 processors 
In order to maximize the execution throughput, they speculatively fetch, decode, and execute well ahead of the timer. So what happens once the front end of a more execute encounters a self-modifying code? Since it's already uh, speculatively uh, fetched, decoded, and executed the load secret, because this is what the program is saying, when uh, it encounters the store instruction, which is trying to, f uh, to modify the already fetched code, it will have to flush its pipeline from the previously fetched, decoded, and executed instruction, in this case, the load secret, and take into account the new instruction that is being stored, which is the no operation, and then refetch it, decode it, and execute it. But since this detection of a self modified code is not immediate, this creates a temporary window where the micro actual side effects of the speculatively fetched code and executed instruction, in this case, the load, the load secret, can be still observed through caches and other buffers in the CPU, as we saw earlier. And if an attacker can have a side channel and be able to observe what has been executed um, uh, in the sale code, from the sale code, in this case, the load secret, it then can, uh, it, it then can leak uh, the information that was loaded. So the architecture we find here is that store instructions always target data addresses. And this invariant is violated in the case of a self-modifying code which targets code addresses instead. This violation allows an attacker to transiently execute stale code, in this case, the load secret. And in order to understand how this can be exploited, we need first to understand um, what is the uh, attack primitive that this type of machine clear is providing us. So we can break this down to two main steps. We need to write code and we need then to execute it. These are the two fundamental steps that we need to do in order to perform a self-modifying code. So the attack primitive, which is built on top of self-modifying code machine player, is called store, uh, speculative code server pass. And it, uh, it, uh, it's built on top of a, uh, a transient window created and originated by self-modifying code machine player. And it allows an attacker to execute stale code as we saw earlier. So this can be broken down in uh, three steps, but uh, keep in mind that code and data are two views of the same exact memory, and they're always kept coherent, be coherent between each other all the time, at least on the architectural uh, level. And code, code uh, and data, code view and data view can be uh, instruction cache and data cache, for example. So in the first step of our attack primitive, we need to perform the first step of a self-modifying code, which is storing code. And there are different uh, use case uh, uh, scenarios where this can be performed. Let's say, for example, JIT engines where code is under the attacker's control can uh, decide what is the code being uh, jitted. So in th uh, step one, we uh, store the code of a function f at the address where the code of a function g is residing. And we do this uh, in the data view, in data cache, because we're storing code as data. This will temporarily desynchronize what uh, the code that is residing at the same address in the code view compared to what we just stored in the data view at the same exact address. And now, if we try to perform the second step of a self-modifying code, which is executing code, and we try to call function f that we just stored, the CPU, or may, uh, I mean, the, more precisely, the front end, will try to fetch and decode and execute transiently the code that is residing at that address from the code view, which is the code of function g. Later, it will detect that this was a self-modifying code, and then will flush the pipeline from the code of function G, and then eventually resynchronize the two views and fetch and decode and execute the code uh, function F, which was intended to be executed in the first place. But the side effects, the microtextual trace that an attacker can observe of the stale code that was executed, in this case function G, is still there. It can be observed. When we were reverse engineering this behavior, and we looked at the software development manual of Intel uh, of how to handle self modifying code and customer five code, we uh, saw that there are two options being suggested to handle these cases. And interestingly, option one is describing the exact steps that we need to perform our attack primitive. So any software that is adopting option one to handle self modifying code is actually performing a speculative code server pass attack. In fact, uh, two main web browsers, Chromium and Firefox, when they did new code, they're not doing any operations whatsoever because they rely on the fact that code and data are always kept coherent, which they are on the architectural level, but on microarchitecture, this is not guaranteed at all. 
So to exploit uh, a self-modifying machine player, we have speculative code store bypass, which allows an attacker to uh, execute cell code, which is somehow similar to its architectural counterpart, uh, a use of the free, uh, for example, a stack primitive, which allows an attacker to reference uh, data that is not uh, in memory yet, that is not referenced yet anymore, sorry. So this was one type of machine clear. The second type that we're presenting today is called memory ordering. And we're going to start from a definition, what is a memory order model? In this case, uh, a, total store, a total store order memory model guarantees that all CPU cores see all memory operations as the program order, except in one case, uh, when we have a store instruction followed by a load instruction operating on different addresses, these two instructions might be, might be reordered. Let's take a look at that example to make it easier to, to, to follow. So here we have two processors, two cores. So, uh, processor A is performing two load instructions from address X and Y, and then a subsequent dependent operation. And processor B is uh, performing a two store instructions at the same addresses that processor A is loading. Let's say that, for example, uh, the first load in processor A is slow, there's a cache miss, that data at address X need to be fetched from DRAM, that takes uh, uh, too long. So processor A, as we saw, tries to optimize all the different operations that can be done at the microarchitectural level. So internally, at the microarchitectural level, it will violate the uh, memory model and executing out of order the second load on address Y and all subsequent dependent operations. And it will keep them in a ready commit state. So when then the data at address X is being uh, fetched from DRAM, it will commit everything architecturally in order and then being, uh, following the, the memory model. But internally on the microtextual level, it can do all sort of uh, optimizations that uh, can also uh, violate uh, the memory model. So let's assume that at this point, processor B performs the, uh, the two stores at the same addresses that uh, processor A loaded out of order. At this point, Processor A is basically caught red-handed. Like, I mean, cannot commit anymore the data that was loaded out of order because it otherwise it would be the proof, the architectural proof that it actually violated the memory model internally. And what it, it has to do now is flush the pipeline from the ready-to-commit instructions that it performed out or out of order, take into account the new value that has been stored by processor B at address Y, and then re-execute the uh, load over uh, Y again and commit everything in program order to be uh, compliant with the memory model. So in this case, the architecture environment of this type of machine clear is, called, uh, is that out of order execution always complies with the uh, total store uh, order memory model. This uh, invariant is violated in the case of a memory uh, ordering model uh, as we saw uh, earlier. And the security implication here is that an attacker, uh, this allows an attacker to transiently leak stale data, um, uh, which in, in this case, the load that it was performed out of order. And uh, to exploit this, this is not uh, trivial at all because we need to synchronize the, two, the execution of the two instructions on the microarchitectural micro level from two different cores. Okay, now we'll look at the different types of machine clear that we're presenting. Okay, now we switch to the third type of machine clear that we're presenting today, that is uh, about floating points. So when the IEEE guys decided to create the standard for floating points, they decided to do not waste any uh, space of the 64 or 32 bit of the floating point numbers. And they uh, allocated a special range of floating point numbers for very small uh, numbers that are uh, named subnormal or the normal. So to keep it short, every number for the double representation smaller than two to the power of negative 1022, it will be represented differently from the other, uh, let's say standard uh, floating point numbers. Uh, to better explain, let's have a look at this uh, small snippet of code, just a floating point division followed by a floating point uh, addition. So as you can imagine, I don't know, the hardware designer at Intel and and so on, they were not happy about this uh, special case. So they optimized the hardware to only handle not, uh, normal floating point numbers. And in the case of subnormal numbers, they will handle it in a special way, okay? 
So again, let's have a look at this example. So we have a normal floating point division. And let's assume that the results or the operands are in this uh, strange uh, subnormal uh, uh, range of floating point numbers. So what happens is that uh, the FPU will generate a wrongly computed results because again, the hardware is not capable to handle such numbers. So it will provide these wrong results to subsequent instruction. And only later, after a bit, it will discover, oh damn, this was a wrong result, sorry for that. Let me remove everything from the pipeline. Let me compute the correct results with a microcode assist. Uh, by the way, this is uh, a software division, so again, the hardware is not capable. So the processor is injecting literally instruction in the pipeline to compute the division by the software. And then it will provide the results to the subsequent uh, instruction. As you can imagine, this is a huge performance uh, hit. Uh, however, the subnormal numbers are usually rare enough to not cause any damage in the performance. But here we notice that basically the hardware of the floating point unit is totally biased on just working on uh, normal numbers. And we can simply violate this invariant by performing any operation on uh, subnormal numbers. And here the security implication is that an attacker can inject a wrong results on the pipeline, okay? And regarding exploitation, uh, here things <coughs> get quite interesting in our opinion because our primitive is to inject a floating point result. If you think about this, strange, not common. So we managed to build an end-to-end -end exploit. Let me to show you the details now. This is the attack setup. On the left, we have a victim page with some content that you want to, to leak. And on the right, we have an iframe. Imagine this is an advertisement or uh, stuff like that. And please notice these are on two different origins because Firefox, uh, maybe now, but I'm sure a uh, few months ago, didn't have the set isolation. So uh, this was still a totally working attack. And so before we said we can inject a wrongly computed results, okay? But due to some uh, fuzzing reverse engineering, we managed to build a tool where you simply provide the value that you want to see transiently, so the wrongly computed results. For example, we want to see that diff as a speculative results. And the tool will give you the X and Y operand to perform division to get the specific values transiently. So for example, uh, the tool on the bottom is just a, it will perform the division and give you the true results. So the correct one, the architectural one, if you can see is minus infinity, uh, it's here. While uh, the transient results is actually that diff zero zero as we specified before. Maybe now you start to see where the exploit is going to, uh, to, uh, to attack. So you see the upper bits are set to FFFB and more precisely, this is a non, not a number floating point value. And in Firefox engine, uh, the JavaScript engine of Firefox, actually every JavaScript object is represented using a floating point number. It's a nice trick to reuse the a new space of uh, floating point numbers, where um, basically the, the upper bits are used to store the type of the object, of the variable, and the bottom bits are used for the payload. So for example, FFB is for type string, and that diff is the payload that is a pointer to the content of the string, okay? Uh, while for example, uh, the, uh, this other number here is just a standard uh, floating point uh, double value, okay? So what happens if in JavaScript we perform the division of these two values, and right after we ask uh, the engine, look, what is the type of Z, the floating point division results? Well, here we are performing speculative type confusion, where basically, transiently, since we set the high bits to FFB, the engine will believe, ah, of course the floating point division is of type string, while architecturally when the results will be minus infinity, it will take the other branch, okay? So the red part will only be executed transiently in a speculative window. And as you notice, we have a control of these uh, lower bits that are the pointer of the string, this uh, dead bit value. And now it's game over because, for example, we can access the string length uh, attribute, for example. And actually, we are the referencing arbitrary memory addresses. 
and we can use a simple uh, uh, partial load the side channel to leave an trace that later we can observe to uh, to leak actually the memory content pointed by this corrupted pointer. Uh, one last piece to conclude the, the attack, and I think also this is nice because we show the you know the, the power of uh, transient execution attacks. We we can easily also bypass uh, SLR. We just need to allocate a big chunk of memory, this uh, attack restraint memory, with all A's, for example. One gigabyte is uh, sufficient. And then what we do, we leak at coarse grained addresses uh, until we leak all A's, okay? And the nice part here is that all this um, execution is speculative, okay? So if, for example, we use this address here that is not even mapped, it should kind of cache Firefox, but this is speculative, we can do whatever we want because nothing of this is, commit is uh, committed, so we can uh, spray the memory and read whatever we want without crashing anything. We also have a demo of the attack. As you can see here on the left, we have the, the victim on the right, the, the frame. We run the attack. So as I said before, we start by allocating one gigabyte of um, known uh, memory, and right after, we are going to, first of all, to break SLR by a cross-grained uh, search. And here, please notice that we are generating the X and Y operand, the totem point division, to generate, so the PC was too strong, so. <laughs> Wait a second, let me, okay. So we were leaking, uh, sorry, we were breaking, breaking SLR, and, um, here, please notice that we are generating the X and Y operand to generate the specific address we want to, to leak. Uh, this takes usually a few seconds. Exactly, now we have broke uh, SLR. Now we are already leaking the memory of the victim. We are just only printing when we find something meaningful. Uh, here again, the speed was 13 kilobytes per second, so you will see exactly soon as now we are leaking the, the victim page. And also it's nice because if we leave running for a bit, we also start leaking other stuff like it seems like JavaScript code, we have no idea. So we have full uh, compromise the, the process. And uh, again, if you think about, at least for us, this is pretty crazy attack because from a floating point division to a uh, read arbitrary uh, memory, uh, all in a JIT engine, again, using speculative uh, attacks was uh, yeah, pretty good. Uh, yeah, as I said, the leakage rate was about 13 kilobytes per second. Uh, yeah, just briefly about mitigation. There are multiples. You can simply disable the, this representation in the floating point unit. We also implemented a compiler pass to serialize uh, possible FPV gadgets. Uh, with a 53% overhead. Or uh, as Firefox did, uh, basically now after every floating point operation, they conditionally check that the floating point result is not of type none, so you cannot anymore, uh, let's say, type confuse the JavaScript engine. While Chrome was safe by default because uh, was already using uh, site isolation. Now we'll quickly present the last type of machine clear, that is uh, memory translation. So when we have a load instruction followed by a store instruction and the destination of the store is not ready yet, there is a special predictor named uh, memory translation unit that tries to predict if this sto uh, store load instruction are operating on the same address, so aliasing or not aliasing. It's quite simple, let's look as always uh, as an example. Imagine you have a store followed by a load, and let's say that the store address is yet not known, this uh, xx value. So the processor will not wait for the store to complete, it will start doing the, the load operation uh, instantly. And um, for doing that, actually, it will ask the floating predictor if the store and the load will be on the same address. And then let's say the predictor will uh, say, no, no, you can continue out of order because we are not aliasing. So the CPU will actually perform the load before the store. But what happens is factually the store and the load were on the same address. Well, the processor needs to squash all this instruction, clean the pipeline, perform the store, and only then 
to the lobe. Or you can see here the, the transient path uh, loaded some stale value. And here the invariant is that the, basically the memory obligation unit never fails. And to violate that, the attacker needs to massage the predictor to make a wrong new prediction here. And implication, as I said, is that we are leaking stale data from memory. And this was already known in the past uh, as a Spectre D4, or also Spectre D4 bypass. Uh, however, Intel defines this as a machine clear type, so we also presented it today. Now, ah, yes. Um, if you really like this, uh, this presentation, you can also have a look at our paper. There are many other machine clears, like uh, all these corner case of the processor. For example, we have complex uh, mask move uh, instruction, exception, other inter interrupts, uh, a lot of microcode assist. So as you can see, machine clear is a broad class of uh, uh, transient execution part of the, of the processor. And now, yeah, we conclude with some results. Okay, so now that we've seen many types of machine clear, let's zoom out a bit and look at the big picture. So we saw self-modifying code, uh, machine clear, allowing stale code execution, uh, a memory ordering allowing uh, stale data to be uh, leaked, uh, floating point uh, performing an injection of a wrong result uh, on the transient path, and then uh, lastly, uh, uh, stale uh, memory leak through the uh, misprediction of uh, the aliasing of two addresses through the memory integration unit. So let's look at some numbers to evaluate how these new types of machine clear perform compared to all the previous known uh, causes of uh, transient execution. Here on the x-axis we have the different uh, mechanisms or way to create a transient execution path and on the y-axis we have two metrics to evaluate these, uh, this behavior. The top plot represents the number of uh, transient loads uh, loaded operations that fit in a single transient window, and the bottom uh, plot represents the leakage rate. How how much can we leak with uh, the corresponding uh, transient execution me mechanism? And the blue bars Intel, uh, the red bars are uh, AMD. So here we have the flush and reload. This is the attack that we uh, saw at the beginning of this presentation, representing the architectural upper limit of a leakage rate. Nothing can nothing transiently can leak more than this because these are committed and retired instructions that are leaking memory, uh, but all the others are transient, so they can, uh, uh, the transient window can finish uh, earlier. So they cannot leak more than the architectural leakage. Then we have uh, Intel TSX, BHT, and FOLS, where, uh, which are the three main causes that all previous transient execution attacks were relying on to create a transient execution path and perform these memory leaks. And, um, uh, Intel TSX, as we know, is only available on Intel uh, CPUs and it's not supported anymore on recent CPUs because of these attacks. Um, so an attacker would have been left with uh, mispredicting a branch, like uh, in the case of BHT, or triggering a fault somehow, but it's still using the same root cause. But with our work, we're providing five new uh, ways to create a transient execution path, which are available both on Intel and AMD, and if we can look at the SMC, so self-modifying code machine clear, in a single window tri uh, triggered by self-modifying code, we can fit more than 160 transient loads that will never be observed on the architectural uh, level of the, uh, of the CPU. So 160 loads leaving a microarchitectural trace that can be only observed through some sort of side channel as we saw earlier, which is quite powerful. Many things can fit in 160 loads. Um, another interesting number here is that with a floating point machine clear, we can reach a leakage rate that is more than four megabits per second. There's no predictor to mistrain. There's no, uh, it's not complicated. It's so deterministic once we have an X and Y and we know what is the transient result that will be, uh, will be uh, created. We have an X and Y, we have a transient window that we can uh, use as we saw in our exploit. So now that we have so many ways to create a transient uh, execution path, we try to classify these to have a more, uh, an, an easier way to look at, at these attacks. And we classify those, uh, those mechanisms for a root, based on a root cause. So we have the, the big class of bad speculation that is, uh, has two main subclasses. One is control flow misprediction or branch misprediction, or, uh, and the other one is data misprediction or machine clear. 
And these two subclasses distinguish between are we speculating, speculating on code or are we speculating on data? Then each subclass has its own predictive subclass. Uh, the one under control flow prediction, these are the ones that have been used uh, in all different uh, transition attacks uh, that we saw up until uh, a year ago or so. And, and uh, under the predictors of data prediction, we have the minimum disambiguation that was previously classified as yet a specter variant, but it's actually a type of machine clear because it's predicting over data and not code. So while co uh, control flow prediction are failed attempts to predict what is the next instruction to execute, data prediction or machine clear are failed attempts to predict the value of uh, some sort of data. Then we have the subclass uh, of architectural exceptions that belongs to data prediction, where we have all the different types of page folds that have been used uh, in previous attacks. Then we introduced this new subclass of data prediction, where we, uh, which we called a likely invariant violation, where we have all the different architectural invariants that usually hold but occasionally fail for some for some reason. For example, in the case of floating point unit point machine clear, as long as we're providing two normal numbers, everything is fine, the invariant is not broken, not violated, not, not violated. we don't have a machine clear, but as, uh, as soon as we provide uh, a subnormal or the normal offering or the result of two normal numbers are yielding or giving a subnormal result, everything breaks, the invariant is violated, and we have a machine clear. Also, we observe that we have uh, the class of hardware interrupts that uh, during our reverse engineering, we, we saw that it, uh, they also create uh, a transient window that can be uh, exploited. You can read more about this in our paper. So we disclosed FPDI, STSB to all major CPU browser operating system vendors earlier last year, and we, were, uh, we got confirmed that uh, floating point value injection affects all Intel CPUs, all MD CPUs, and uh, also some ARM uh, CPUs. And when it comes to uh, a CSB or speculative code server pass, again, it affects all Intel CPUs, all AMD CPUs, but in the case of ARM, this does not work because the coherence between code and data are left explicitly to the user, so this cannot work out of the box as it does for Intel and AMD. Um, yeah, Mozilla confirmed FPGI and the deployed mitigation uh, by conditionally masking uh, the malicious uh, NumBox uh, uh, transit result from Firefox 87. And uh, the Zen hypervisor also uh, mitigated a CSB by um, issuing uh, a serializing instruction after it stores the new code. So we don't store and execute uh, uh, right after that, but you store the new code, you issue a serializing instruction to make sure that code and data contain the new code that you just stored, and then you execute that uh, address. So to conclude, uh, bad speculation is not caused only by classic prejudice predictions, but also by architectural invariant violation like the, uh, the entire class of machine clears that we presented uh, today. Uh, these invariants can be exploited, creating new uh, security threats like floating point by injection and speculative code store bypass. And uh, we think that now defenses moving forward must focus on the wider meaning of these, uh, these classes of uh, bad speculation and not only just trying to avoid that an attacker can mistrain a branch uh, predictor or some sort, sort like this. So you can find our paper, the exploit code, and the reverse engineering code uh, on our uh, links. And yeah, thanks for your attention.